For the Zonder Commandos at Syret's concentration camp, escape was now the only thing on most people's minds. Everyone kept to themselves and spoke only in whispers, said Yakov Karper. Still, some people agreed to try and escape and started digging a tunnel in the barracks. They could not manage to do it within one night since they had neither spades nor any other tools and they were digging with their hands. The Zonder Commandos carefully camouflaged the entrance hole and disposed of the spoil under different bunk beds. The SS did not normally enter the prisoners' accommodation at Syretz, probably fearing disease. But, in a terrible twist of fate, one of the prisoners, perhaps hoping to curry favour with the SS, informed them of the tunnel's existence. The 16 men involved with the escape operation were lined up and shot on the spot. When the prisoners were labouring in the ravine and stacking corpses on the furnaces, they worked in chain gangs, the SS carefully checking the prisoners' shackles three times a day. But one prisoner, Fedor Savatani, did manage to escape. He asked the SS guard for permission to relieve himself, and the German unshackled him from the main chain, though he was still wearing ankle shackles to prevent him from running away. At that moment, a group of SS officers arrived on an inspection, distracting the guard. Savatani saw his opportunity. He quickly removed his shackles using a basic key that he had found on a corpse and dashed for the nearby Jewish cemetery. From there, he took off for Kiev. By the time the SS realized that a prisoner was missing, Savatani was well on his way to Kiev, where he managed to hide out until the Soviets retook the city. In revenge, the SS executed 15 other Zonder Commandos. By now the prisoners were becoming desperate. I was lying and thinking that if we could open the padlock on the barracks door and attack the guards, at least some people would escape alive, said Carper. It would be better than all of us being shot without any chance to tell the world about the awful things that took place here. The next morning, Carper fell into conversation with Vodya Kuklia and Leonid Kodomsky, who slept close by. They liked his idea. Perhaps they could find a key. This time, the plan would be kept to only three people to minimize the chance that someone would betray them to the SS. As they labored with the corpses, they found many things in the pockets of their moldy and rotten clothing. The bottom corpses were absolutely naked, the middle layers were half-naked, and the top layer corpses were dressed, said Carper. Once, in one of the pockets, we found a bottle of wine, and we drank it on the spot. The Germans saw it and laughed. Though the SS may have laughed and sneered at the poor wretches they abused and worked to death, they never for a moment realized that a resolute handful among their slaves was secretly working on a daring escape. Carper and his friends searched the fully clothed bodies that they daily dragged out of the burial pits, and the pockets proved to be a veritable gold mine of potential escape kit. They found small tools, scissors, screwdrivers, and many other items. Nearly every corpse had keys on him. People locked their flats and apartments and took the keys with them, said Carper. It was becoming obvious to Carper and the others that they had to escape soon, otherwise the entire operation would be a moot point. Many of those in our team that burned corpses had already perished, said Carper. Some were shot down. Others couldn't stand it and committed suicide. The Germans brought in fresh men almost every day to replenish the labor force, and these newcomers brought news that the Red Army was now very near. This was confirmed one day when the Zonder commandos could hear the distant rumble of artillery fire, as well as by the almost maniacal pace the Germans set as they desperately tried to erase evidence of their crimes. We kept on trying to survive for another day. Every day, more and more people did not come back to the barracks alive. Everyone knew that there would be no liberation for the Zonder commandos. The SS would kill all the remaining workers once the job of clearing up the evidence of Baba Yar was completed. If anyone was to survive, it would have to be by their own ingenuity and bravery. Carper's idea was to collect keys. 
He knew what general type of key would fit the large padlock that the Germans lock shut on the door to their dugout each night. If they could collect enough keys from the dead, they might find a near match. If the prisoners could unlock the door to their dugout, then they could hopefully attempt to escape. But to bring keys to the dugout was very risky. As well as constantly checking the prisoners' shackles, the SS also individually frisked the Zonda commandos before they went back to their accommodation. If the SS found a key, its purpose would have been obvious. The prisoner, and possibly the entire workforce from that dugout, would be executed. Each prisoner would only bring back a single key to avoid any telltale rattling, and Carper instructed some of the others what type of key to look out for. By the end of the day, I found one key that looked like the one we needed, said Carper. I brought it, the other fellows brought back nothing. Either they were afraid or didn't find anything, and said that there was none that looked like the one we needed. The next night, Carper again brought back a key from the burial pits, but his accomplices again returned empty-handed. This continued for several days, and Carper gave up trying to encourage his friends to share his risks. Once enough keys had been assembled, Carper arranged for two of his comrades to shield him from view when the prisoners assembled outside the dugout to receive their evening meal. Working fast, Carper tried again, running the risk of instant execution. Working fast, Carper tried several keys in the padlock. Nothing. The next evening, Carper tried again, running the risk of instant execution should he have been caught with keys in his possession. But the risk was worth it for Carper discovered a key that unlocked the padlock. The rest of the keys were tossed away, and the special key, the key to the future lives of the men in Carper's barrack, was carefully concealed. The dangers of smuggling items into the barracks were graphically demonstrated one day when one of the men on Carper's team was frisked by an SS guard. He felt something solid in one of the man's pockets and ordered him to turn them out. The man had taken a small pair of scissors from one of the corpses. When he protested that he had only taken it so he could cut his hair, the SS was having none of it. Beaten unconscious, the unfortunate man was tossed alive onto one of the furnaces and burned to death. It was a terrible reminder of the risk that Carper and his comrades were running in hiding contraband inside their barrack. Carper and the others could see that the work of clearing the bodies from the burial pits and burning them was coming to an end. The SS ordered the Zonda commandos to clear up the site, in particular to gather up the massive piles of ashes from the pyres, mix them with sand and spread them over the ground and roads. Ominously, although there were no more bodies left to burn, the SS ordered the Zonda commandos to construct one more furnace. It was obvious to everyone that this furnace was meant for the Zonda commandos themselves as soon as they had outlived their usefulness to the Germans. We did not know what to do, said Carper. When we were gathering ashes with a spade near the furnace, I suddenly noticed golden coins in the form of an ingot. They must have been wrapped into something that had got melted together. Impulsively, Carper stuffed the ingot into his shirt and kept working. He never knew when the gold might come in handy. When the new furnace had been built, the SS gathered all of the various Zonda commandos together. Carper recalled, We were lined up and the Germans were whispering something and looking at the road. They must have been waiting for the big bosses. Whatever it was, the SS grew tired and ordered the Zonda commandos to sit down before sending them back to their barracks. But one man inside Carper's barracks, Yakov Steak, spoke German and overheard the SS discussing liquidating the remaining Zonda commandos the next day. Carper decided that if they were going to try and escape, it would have to be that night, 29th of September 1943. In the men whom the SS saw only as walking corpses, there matured a determination that at least one of them must survive to tell the world about what had happened at Baba Yar, said Carper. Carper informed Stayak and David Budnik that he had a key and could open the door to the barrack. Carper's companions were initially almost speechless that anyone had managed to find a key to the lock, but Carper quickly retrieved the key from its hiding place and gave it to Budnik. 
The men agreed to escape later that night by removing the shackles on their ankles and freeing as many of the others on the commandos in the hut as possible, before one man would reach through the barred window and open the padlock hanging from the door. Noise would be their greatest enemy, as they couldn't afford the chains and door to make any untoward sounds that might alert the German guards that were posted just outside the line of barracks. One false move, and they would all be executed without mercy. Once darkness had fallen, a deep silence came over the rows of half-buried barracks. The only sounds were the occasional stifled coughs of sick men and the creak of jackboots as SS guards prowled around. The prisoners started to remove their chains as quietly as possible. Everything was going well when they suddenly heard the unmistakable sound of approaching footsteps and the low murmur of German voices. Everyone froze. A key rattled loudly in the door. Carper, like many others inside the barrack, thought that someone had somehow gained knowledge of their plan and sold them out to the SS. They all prepared for the worst. The door was flung open and in stepped four SS men but instead of carrying MP40s ready to spray the room with automatic fire, they instead hauled two large pots full of potatoes. It was to be the prisoners' last supper. Once the Germans had stomped off, Carper and his closest associates informed the rest of the Zonda Commando of their escape plan. People reacted differently to the news. Some people were so hungry that they simply collected their potatoes and crawled onto their bunks while others were both excited and very scared. It was agreed that they wouldn't do anything until midnight. Sleep was impossible, and most of the Zonda commandos sat in silence, waiting and thinking. A few were beyond caring and would take no part in the enterprise, perhaps hoping for death to release them from the horrors that they had endured at Babi Yar. At midnight, the escape began. Many of the Zonda commandos were afraid to remove their chains, so beaten down were they by the SS, but Carpa and his associates had no such qualms. I noticed a big pair of pincers. I took them and broke the rivets so that the clamps fell off together with the chains, he said. Many of the others followed suit, all the time trying to keep the level of noise to a minimum, as the SS guard outside never strayed too far from the barracks. The only prisoners that they left in chains were those who were asleep, and a few whom they felt they couldn't fully trust. While the prisoners worked to free each other, Volodya Kuklia moved over to the door and peered out through the small barred window. He could see a German sentry standing several feet away, his back to the barrack. It was deathly quiet. Gingerly, Kuklia reached one arm through the window, and pushing his white face against the bars, he tried to push Carper's key into the heavy padlock. It was very difficult, and Kuklia's body trembled from the effort and concentration as he stood on tiptoes pressed against the back of the barrack door. Suddenly, his hand slipped and the padlock banged loudly against the door. The German sentry turned almost immediately, attracted by the sound, just as Kuklia whipped his arm inside. Seconds later, the German's torch illuminated the door as he checked that the lock was still fastened. Backing away from the door, Kuklia tripped over the potato pots with an almighty crash. What's the matter in the barracks? yelled the German sentry, who by now had been joined by one of his comrades. One of the more quick-thinking Zonda commandos shouted back that they were fighting over potatoes. The Germans laughed coldly. One of them called out to another guard patrolling along the tops of the dugouts. They are fighting over potatoes, not knowing that tomorrow they will need nothing. There followed more contemptuous laughter from the Germans before the guards returned to their normal locations and a hush once more descended over everything. It was decided to wait until after the changing of the guard before trying again. The prisoners listened as the guards chatted outside during changeover, until after a while silence returned. Kuklia once again stepped up to the door and began the process of trying to undo the padlock. This time he managed to insert the key without any problems and turned it. After some fiddling, Kuklia removed the key from the lock, leaving the padlock hanging open. It was now or never. Gathering what weapons they could from inside the barrack, the prisoners prepared to fight. Everyone who was going moved up to the door. Philip Vilkes reached through the window and unhitched the open padlock, letting it fall to the ground. He turned and yelled, Run for your lives, comrades! 
There was a roar from the Zonda commandos before the door was wrenched open and the filthy, desperately thin, shaven-headed prisoners surged outside. In those half-naked men who reeked of putrefying flesh, whose bodies were eaten by scabies and covered with a layer of mud and soot, and of whose physical strength so little remained, there survived a spirit that defied everything that the Nazis' new order had done or could do to them, said Kappa. The Germans on guard duty near the barracks barely had time to turn when they were brutally beaten and stabbed to the ground as the hundreds of desperate Jews ran on. An SS man in a wooden watchtower that overlooked the barracks quickly brought his machine gun into action, firing bursts towards the doors of the barracks and into the crowd of shouting and screaming Zonda commandos. Many were cut down by the hail of fire, but enough survived to start streaming off in several directions away from the camp. Many headed into the Baba Yar ravine, while others climbed up towards a nearby highway. The SS reacted with typical speed and homicidal determination. Within minutes, officers were directing hunter-killer teams in pursuit of the fleeing prisoners, some in Kubelwagen field cars or motorcycle combinations. The camp's dog unit followed other prisoners, its Alsatians snarling and barking on straining leads. The SS immediately executed any Jew that they encountered. Yakov, Karper, and a small group managed to keep going through the remaining hours of darkness, with the SS hot on their heels. At dawn, as the shooting continued, one could hear cries, cursing, and the barking of dogs in the distance, he said. Hundreds had escaped from Syretz, but only 15 Zonda commandos survived the resulting manhunt. The SS executed 311. Very different fates awaited the men who conceived the monstrous horrors of Baba Yar and Syretz. Syretz Commandant SS Sturmbannführer Radomsky's days of killing were not yet over. After supervising the execution of the surviving Sonderkommandos at Syretz, Radomsky was transferred to Greece, where the final solution had already been extended and implemented with frightening efficiency. Appointed commandant of Haidari concentration camp just outside Athens, Radomsky instituted a similar reign of terror to that which he had practiced in the Soviet Union. At Haidari, the prisoners, male and female, performed backbreaking manual labor. But the difference with Syretz was that this labor served no other purpose than to grind down the will of those performing it. Prisoners were ordered to dig pits, only for the SS to order them filled in again, to break rocks or build walls, the ones completed would be torn down again. In his year in command, Radomsky had 1,800 prisoners executed, mostly by shooting. Another 300 were tortured to death, either at Haidari or in the infamous Gestapo headquarters in Athens. But Radomsky fell from grace in August 1944. A heavy drinker, during one riotous bender, he threatened his second-in-command with a pistol, Executing prisoners on a whim was absolutely fine to the Nazis, but threatening a fellow SS man was most definitely not allowed. Radomsky was reassigned to a slightly more dangerous unit, fighting partisans in Hungary. In 2005, it was finally established that partisans had killed the monster of Syretz on the 14th of March 1945. Paul Blobel, the architect of the Baba Yar massacre and Zonda Aktion 1005, the foul clean-up job that cost the lives of so many more Jews, also ended up fighting partisans, this time in Yugoslavia. There seems to have been a conscious decision on the part of Himmler to quietly get rid of some of the mass murderers responsible for the Einsatzgruppen executions and the Aktion Reinhard gassings. Most were assigned to dangerous anti-partisan duties in southern Europe, where many were killed in action. Blobel survived until the end of the war and tried to make himself scarce, but the law eventually caught up with him and he was arraigned before the Einsatzgruppen trial at Nuremberg in 1951. Unsurprisingly, Blobel, now but a shadow of his former self and sporting a grey beard, was sentenced to death. He was hanged at Landsberg Prison, where Hitler had been held after the 1923 Munich Putsch on the 7th of June 1951. It was a small measure of justice for his victims, believed in total to number over 59,000 people. 
Many thanks for listening. Please subscribe and share, and also visit my video channel, Mark Felton Productions. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below. Thank you.